Thanks for coming. Yeah. So I just want to give you a little overview of the evening. So we have 5 to 6.15, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of writing the book, because I thought that might be interesting to you just as a process of, you know, what this has been like. And then I'll go into reading stories and I'll share stories from the book. And then we'll go into some Q&A. So I just want to make sure you're super comfortable. You're, you know, you're on mute. I won't be looking at the chat. So if you have any issues, you're just going to have to manage them yourself. <laughs> and um, I think we'll, we'll dive in. Does that sound good? Like you guys are, you're, you're good. Okay, we're good. All right. First of all, I wanted to say thank you for being here. This has been, it's kind of a momentous moment for me writing this book. And as I start, I particularly want to thank Erez. He's my, he's one of my best friends and he was my husband for 13 years. And it was last September that he said, are you going to write the book? Like, are you going to write the book? Cause it's kind of time. So that's how it started well, it's not really how it started, but that's how the ball really got rolling on doing this book and then going through the process. And then Tim Flynn, who's not able to be here tonight, he was my writing partner. And all year long, we met and read stories to each other that we were writing simultaneously. And he also just published his book. And then Lo, who spoke earlier, she and I were um, part of a poetry group that we formed that uh, we had four people in. And that was a big piece of the writing practice. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and we'll just do this piece of, you know, sharing with you part of the process. So I just wanted to start with, you know, why, why do we even go to the trouble of writing a book? And I love this quote from Rilke that says, go into yourself, find out the reason that commands you to write see whether it has spread its roots into the very depth of your heart. And for me, I've always felt like I was a writer. I, I started a journalism school at Northwestern with Nancy Green, who's here. And we were in the journalism school together. And then I realized for myself that I felt like I was really more a journalist of the inner world rather than the outer world. And that these stories, while they are mine, you know, they're very personal stories, they have this universal flavor because I've, I've chosen to be willing to share the, the machinations of all the feelings, the grief, the anxiety, the shame, the guilt, you know, and then the adventure, the joy, the curiosity, and, I feel like all of these pieces are really what make us human. And just the other, just the other night, I had a friend to dinner. She's like, how, do, how is it that you can share these? And I, I said, it's, it's really because, I, you know, I'm a micro of the macro. And we're all having these experiences, slightly different because we're all different people, but still similar in their um, tenor of what it means to be human. Like grief is grief you know, ecstatic joy is ecstatic joy felt through each of us. So here is Benji and this, I just took this picture. He's really old now, but this little slideshow done in a PowerPoint is the process of writing the book. So writing in Bart's shoes. And I show him because he's just, oh, he and Zara are always with me. They're my writing companions. Every final project starts with an idea and I just wanted to share how the time that this took, because people ask, well, how long did it take you to write the book? And I would say it took me eight to 10 years of contemplating writing the book, then 35 years of actually writing and documenting. So I've been doing these writing journals for 35 years. And then about a year, of plucking, buffing, and polishing the stories. Here is one little stack of my journals. And I spent the winter of 2021 going through uh, over 50 of these writing journals. 
and really pulling stories and plucking the stories. And, you know, I, I noticed actually in my own book, it's like, oh yeah, you, you left out chunks of your life. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, I, this is what I had written. And, and so I wrote, I rewrote, I edited, I talked to Tim every other week and he gave me incredible feedback. And then I wanted to talk about this for all, for all of us, right? That there's a struggle in this process of creation that I definitely, these are the things I struggled with. I struggled with self-doubt. I wondered, what am I doing with these stories? I struggled with the fear of not finishing, not really making it happen, even though I'd had this vision for such a long time. I struggled with the uncertainty of, you know, what would this be? I still don't know what it will be, but it's in process now. I struggled with the whole question, like, why bother? Why, why am I doing this? Particularly in the beginning, when these stories felt pretty tender to reveal to people. Oh, and then here's more practical things that I struggled with. You know, once I got really going and I was committed, I struggled for months and months and months finding the title. That was a process. And then the creating the cover, that was also a huge process. Oh, and I questioned the format. Yes, I questioned the format of this book. Like I haven't seen a book of a memoir told in 108 stories, but what happened for me is that I decided this is the style of writing that I do. You know, I'm not like a novel person. I'm not going to write long things. I liked the short and the tight. That's sort of, you know, you read it and it's over. And it's funny because I am a writer, but I actually really like, I, I don't read long novels. So I wanted it short and sweet. <laughs> so one of the big things in this process has been the support. And I just want to say thank you to, first of all, to all of you, you know, for being here. Thank you to the people who were close in on this process. And again, Tim, he was really like every other week with me. My poetry group, as I mentioned, we were every other week meeting, really helping me with the writing. Friends who offered to be test readers, and you know who you are. You helped me. You gave me the confidence to keep going. It's like, oh, okay, this is landing. You know, this is landing somewhere. So that was awesome. And then the friends who were cheering me on by the side. This was like, we all need our team of people to just keep saying, go. You've got to keep going. And of course, you, you guys know, you gals and guys know who you are. Truly my community. And I feel like I've actually been in dialogue with you through my newsletters and also Facebook. So it's been really fun to, to have that dialogue and support with you. And really critical, I think, for anyone doing a big project. So the next piece of this is that we have to trust the process. And I think at this point in my life, having been an artist, and I'm still an artist and a writer, that I know it's going to get messy. I know that I'm not going to know parts of the process that are ahead, and that I have to keep showing up. And I have to keep showing up. And eventually, with patience, all the parts will come together. And, you know, that, that is what happened. So I, I, I do want to share a little bit about a few parts of this process. Like, I just could not get the title. And I ended up crowdsourcing on Facebook, which some of you may have seen. I was like, oh my gosh, can you help me with the title? And I gave the intro to my book. And it just wasn't that. And then I, you know, I, I didn't, like, I probably had a hundred titles and I took them all and I contemplated them all. I was super grateful, but I'm like, not quite it. So then I asked my friends, you know, I was like, what do you think? And then finally it came and it was one of the titles of my stories in Borrowed Shoes. And I just want to say what this title means to me, because I'm curious what it, what it means to you, like how you hear it. But how I hear it is we, as we go through our lives, we are borrowing identities along the way. We're trying things out. So we step into the shoes 
say, of our parents to start, because that's who raises us. And then we step into the shoes of, you know, our politics or our religion or our school or our country. And each of these is a portion and piece of our identity, but all along the way, in a way, it's kind of a borrowed identity. And, and we have an identity and then we shed it and we become something else and we keep blooming into ourselves. And that's why I have a flower coming out of the shoes. It's like we're blooming into ourselves. Yeah, after months of wondering. So I want to show you um, this. So imagine just the, the right side, or at least it's the right side to me with the hanging tennis shoes in borrowed shoes. That was going to be the cover. And then the wraparound to the other side was going to be the high heel and the tennis shoe. And I showed it to Tim, my writing partner, and he and he's known me like 30 years. And he literally, he goes, yeah, that's nice. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's done. I was so ready to be done. He's like, yeah, that, that's nice. I'm totally missing the Diane Sherman-ness of this. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, look at it. There's no color. There's no like zhuzh of color and energy. And I, I was so annoyed. I mean, I, but once I, I looked at it, I thought, oh, he's really right. You know, he's right. So I looked in my journal, which is here, and this is a piece that I loved. And I was like, what does it mean, the Diane Sherman? You know, we can't see ourselves, the Diane Shermanness of the cover. And then I thought, oh, I just have to put in, like, I have to put in a flower because I love the flowers and I love the color. And so it was just funny that right there in my own journal was what I ended up using on the cover. And, and it helped me lean into trusting myself, trusting my art, trusting these short vignettes, the way I'm telling my own personal story and leaning in to my own voice and style. It's amazing how long I think it, it, it takes us, right? So here, and, and I show you this, this is, I'll show it to you when I'm, we're not in the slideshow, but, this is my mala and the, a mala is kind of equivalent of the rosary beads of a, of a Catholic um, person. And the Buddhists use the mala to count their mantras and prayers essentially. And I decided to do 108 moments strung together like a mala bead so that they would be points of contemplation of some sort that would invite you the reader to contemplate your own moments of life. Because I think of life, you know, we can't remember all the moments of our lives, but it's kind of collaged together. And that's, that's how I see this book. So I'm gonna pause here with, this, with the screen share and come out and we'll start some, um, I'll, I'll share some stories. So, Got a few marked out for you. And so mind you, I just want to say I, I grew up Catholic. One of the themes of this book is kind of shedding, not shedding the rituals or the beauty and power of Catholicism, but shedding the places that I internalized the shame around sexuality and my body. And so that's actually been a big piece of my own journey is to is to own those pieces of myself as a human being without the shame and the guilt. So I'm gonna start us off, I'm kicking us off with this story and it's called masturbation. And it's not, it's not, it's probably not what you think, but here you go. So here we go. I'm in ninth grade in Mr. Sasso's class. He's a lay teacher in our Catholic school I never really understood why they called them lay teachers. He's just blown up a condom like a balloon and is batting it around the classroom. How many of you think masturbation is not a normal thing to do? He asks the class. I am so certain of my answer 
I shoot my hand into the air, expecting the rest of the class to do the same. I mean, my hand is up in a nanosecond, straight up, erect, proud. Until, until I see mine is only one of two hands raised. In a flash of awareness, I realize not only do I feel the rising heat of embarrassment, worse. Shame spreads through me like a wildfire, but suddenly I'm aware that everyone in the room must be doing it, to think it's normal, and clearly I'm not doing it. Because isn't it what they've been telling us for years? Don't touch yourself down there in the hinterlands where pleasurable sensations vibrate between your legs when you ride your bike or when that boy, the one we called the flag as a code name, walks by. Isn't that the memo they've been passing around from underneath the wimple the nuns wear to cover their hair and heads like some medieval garment? Didn't they say, We'd go to hell if we did that. And God forbid any activity with anyone else before you get married. I glance around the silent room, suddenly outed for my archaic thoughts, the ones I bought hook, line, and sinker. I wish the floor would open up and swallow me into the bowels of the earth. But no. Mr. Sasso saunters up to my desk, my head already hanging like Jesus on the cross. Please no, please, please no, please no, just go away. Just ignore me. Please, God, make him go away. I secretly beg. Diane, so why do you think it's not normal to masturbate? Really? Really? I want to scream at him because you people have been telling us that for years. I've been in Catholic school getting indoctrinated for 10 years already. Why would I not think that? But that is not what I say. I mumble something inept like, I, I, I don't know, just is as I get as small as I can, wishing I were Alice in Wonderland, able to drop into the rabbit hole. My entire body posture tells him to get away from me. You've humiliated me in front of my peers and I will have to live this out forever. Does he have any idea what he's done? The rest of the class is a blur. I remember nothing. So, that's the beginning of my, my journey, which I thought could give you some context. Um, so really this book is, you know, it's the journey, right? It's the journey of awakening little bits of awareness and awakening to myself. And then I think of ourselves. So a lot, you know, many of you I met um, in yoga, in the yoga world, some of you, you know, I was a uh, teacher. So I thought I would share this, this one, this is called first yoga class. My lower back hurts, my wrists feel tight. I go to the chiropractor at least once a week. I sit at a desk for a good chunk of the day, moving the mouse this way and that in between all the click, click, click of the keyboard. My 30-something beautiful blonde, full of chi chiropractor says, you might want to do yoga for your back. Just drops that little pearl into my consciousness. Yoga? Oh my God, that sounds so boring. I say, I'm a runner. A biker, a dancer. Yoga seems like it's for old, soft people. No, really. It will help relieve your lower back pain and you won't have to come see me as often. I like seeing her. She's so vibrant and has such good energy. Despite myself, I heed her words and ask around about yoga classes in San Francisco, where I live in the Richmond by Ocean Beach. I find the Shivananda Ashram, which is close in by the sunset, close by in the sunset on Golden Gate Park. 
I have no idea what to expect. I've never been to a yoga class before. I trek there on a Saturday, and as I enter the funky Victorian, I immediately smell incense waft down the stairs. My stomach flutters a bit, and I think maybe I should leave while I can. Just as I have this thought, a thin man dressed in all white greets me with a warm smile. Welcome, he says as he peers down the staircase. Hi, I say, nervously looking up the steep steps. Is this your first time here? Yes, I say, wishing I could leave, but I begin the trek up the stairs. Come in. He gestures into a small room, which has a picture of a guru with a garland of flowers draped over it. Candles flicker and soft Indian music comes. Have you done yoga before? He asks. No, I'm brand new, I say with trepidation. He gives me a yoga mat and a variety of props, a block, blanket, a strap, and invites me to sit down on the mat until class begins. I can't help wondering what these things are for and how we'll use them. I begin to relax. The incense and candles remind me of my Catholic roots. I shut my eyes. Other students mill in, take their spots in the room, set themselves up with confidence and shut their eyes. We wait for the teacher and then it begins, the practice as they call it. We start with deep breathing, then we hold one nostril shut, breathe in and out of it, then switch to the other side. I try to follow along. We move right into the physical exercises, and I have no idea what I'm doing. I wish I could disappear. Everyone in the room seems to know the postures, and the teacher leads us through as though we should know each contorted pose he's doing. It's hard. I feel my heart beating, my breath heavy. We twist our bodies, move them back and forth, all the while being encouraged to breathe as deeply as possible. Then they all go into headstand. No way. I'm not doing that. I just watch. Finally, we lie down, down on the yoga mats and take a nap for a few minutes. And at the end, we sit upright, eyes shut, and they all sing some chant. Curry, smell, curry smells emanate from the kitchen. I can't wait to leave. The man who greeted me at the top of the stairs says, you're welcome to stay for a vegetarian lunch. Yeah, thank you. I have to go. I have somewhere to be right now. I lie. I hightail it down the stairs feeling relieved I endured. Yeah. No yoga for me. I'll stick to running. So to those of you who've been in my yoga classes, <laughs> that was my beginning. It's like, oh yeah. You know, we forget. I think we all forget when we've become, um, you know, really good at something when we've mastered something over hours and hours and months and years. It's like, oh yeah, the beginning of anything is tricky. All right, I'm gonna go on, keep, keep reading some stories here. So this one is called Be Present. I'm sitting on top of a mountain in New Mexico. The sun beams down, white puffy clouds float by like the thoughts in my mind. I'm on a vision quest with just four gallons of water for the four days I'll be out here with only a tarp and me, myself and I. I've come because I have some questions. It is six months after the Oakland accident that left me and my boyfriend lying on the blacktop like squashed flies. I feel lucky to be alive. Now, now, I'm no camper, despite my love for the outdoors. I had some big fears before this retreat, like being rained on, 
getting wet and being cold. So I prayed hard for sunshine, no rain. Careful what you wish for. I'm now chasing shade, loping from one skinny scraggly tree to the next, hoping to find a sliver of shade. I keep repeating the question I've brought. Why am I still here? And what am I supposed to do? I've been given a second chance and I don't wanna waste it. The accident shook me awake. I was living in an artist loft in an industrial, in industrial Oakland with my boyfriend, going to raves, dancing all night to pulsing music, seeking the face of God. I'd dance myself into a trance in front of the speakers. It was fun, but I knew it wasn't a sustainable life for me. We helped our consciousness find the divine and take ecstasy, LSD, or mushrooms. Sometimes I'd just smoke a little pot. At home in the loft, my musician DJ boyfriend, he'd play me songs and say, listen to this. And I'd find the rhythm of the song in my hips dancing around the big open space. Listen to the bass line, he'd say, or listen to the cymbals. He trained my ear. I loved having my own personal DJ to curate music for my listening pleasure. That life came to a screeching halt that year, this year. It was Ash Wednesday when we were hit by the car. I knew I'd been thrown into my own kind of desert to find a new me. So here I now sit asking the question, why am I still here? And what am I supposed to do? As I chase shade, watch clouds, and sit through hunger pains, the answer arrives in two words. Be present. After three days, I continue, I continue to ask, hoping for more direction, like become a social worker, go teach art in Rwanda. But the answer continues to be the same be present. After day three of blasting golden rays and sapphire blue skies with afternoon cotton candy clouds, I am praying for rain, or at least gray skies. I keep asking the same question and getting the same answer, be present. When finally it's time to descend the mountain and reconvene with the, out, the other 11 questers for the rest of the 12 day retreat, I accept my two word answer, knowing I'll have to chew on it for a while to figure out exactly what it means and why it is the one I've been given. Right now, I'm happy enough to accept the slice of watermelon offered me to break the fast. So that was 1999, that accident and that vision quest. And, you know, I went, I went on to become a yoga teacher, as many of you know, and I felt like that was what I did. I became more present and then I taught being present. It's like, oh, how can we be present and not miss our moments? And in many ways, you know, that is, that is the gist of this book that to be present to our lives, no matter what's happening, is really the, um, it's really the task for all of us. Because if we're not present, we're, miss we're missing this moment, even if we want it to be something else. So. so then I thought I would read you the title story in Borrowed Shoes. Mm. Okay, let's have a little beverage though. I'm, ha I'm having, lemon water. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So in borrowed shoes, here we go. <clears throat> I don't know what I was thinking. I brought only one pair of hiking boots to trek in Tibet and Nepal for five weeks. I like to travel light, but when things like this happen, I want to kick myself. I also didn't want to break in two sets of boots, nor did I want to spend the money on two pair, even though this was the trip of a lifetime. 
I wish I bought and brought a second pair because the stitching that holds the sole of my boot to the top has come loose. There's a little opening that has concerned me for a few days and we're only three quarters of the way through our trek. We walk six to eight hours a day over craggy terrain at high altitude. My boots need to last. The terrain is rough, rocky, unforgiving, and hard on footwear. Our Tibetan guides who port and carry our gear, tents, and food wear socks with sandals and tennis shoes. When I see them scuttle up ahead of us with ease, I feel the weight of my privileged life, my comfortable bed, all the perfect gear I've brought to contend with fickle mountain weather. A few days ago, I got lucky. There was a cobbler of sorts in the tiny village we stopped in. He was able to switch my, stitch my boots back together. It felt like divine providence to find what I needed out in the middle of this harsh, de deserted mountain landscape. But with the daily use of my boots, the stitching hasn't held and I'm turning to more desperate measures. Duct tape. That wide gray sticky tape that holds everything together, even makeshift housing for some who live on the streets of San Francisco and tape cardboard boxes together to shield themselves against the weather. Someone on our trip brought duct tape. So I, now, I have now wrapped my left boot with the ugly sticky stuff in a last ditch effort to get some, get some more miles out of these boots. The downside, is that I've lost some traction, but it seems to work. I trudge along for a few days, mala beads in hand, and continue chanting for peace in the world with each step. Om Mani Padme Om, Om Mani Padme Om. Then it happens. Rain comes. The tape frays, gets gooey. It's a gummy mess. I feel pitiful. What to do? I must ask my fellow travelers if anyone has extra shoes that will, that will fit me that they can spare. To my relief, one woman does. When she offers me her extra pair of tennis shoes, I am beyond grateful. I don't know what I would do without shoes to continue the trek. She radiates warmth and kindness, this woman who is a few decades older than me, again, I'm astonished at how well I am held, how I have everything I need in the moment, have everything I need in the moment I need it. The following day, I retire my well-worn boots, now stitched and bandaged together, and don her white tennis shoes to finish the journey. So that trip to Tibet, that was a trip after the accident. It was a year and a half after the, my car accident. And it was really a trip to, um, to, to answer the question, you know, be present. What is it I'm here to do? I was still really searching, like, what am I doing? And this, those mala beads that you saw, this is the mala that um, I took with me. And I prayed and chanted with each of these beads that whole trip. So it's, you know, it's a really special mala. Um, I want to, I, there's one story I want to look for that I didn't uh, mark easily. So I'm going to just take a moment here. Oh, yeah. Bear with me a sec. Okay, but I won't read that quite yet. All right, so some of you know what I've been doing in my own life is traveling and experiencing other cultures. And I, I feel like one of the reasons I love going to places that are really different from where I live is that I, I like to learn about the world through people and through their own culture. So this is an India story. And 
it's called it's called the lizard who flew out of my ass so here you go and some of you susan were you on that trip i don't know if you were on that trip but it was one of those trips um with mella when i was leading those with her so here we go i have never suffered from constipation in my life if anything i am the opposite I don't know that big buildup of food that sits in your colon for days and begins to petri putrefy, petrify. I don't know the discomfort of a distended belly, the deep desire to have things move out of you. No, that has not been my thing. Until one trip to India. Now, usually when you go to India, you're stocked with all the remedies to plug you up. You carry scrunched up tissues in your pocket because you're afraid you'll get some bug and have to run to a gritty squat toilet when the runs rip. That was not true for me this trip. No, I have a bloated, pouchy, poochy belly and I'm completely blocked up. As one day turns to two, then three, I begin downing rem remedies to help things release. I drink coffee tea, take triphala supplements. Finally, I turn to psyllium husk on day four to loosen things up. And let me tell you, when you mix psyllium husk with a glass of water and you haven't had a bowel movement in four days, you feel four months pregnant. Let's just say I'm not at my best. And I'm here to lead a retreat teaching yoga and creative process. But all I can think about is pooping and getting this backed up shit out of me. Oh, the metaphor is not lost on me. And I ask myself all the questions. What am I holding on to? What shit in my life am I not looking at? Is there some dark secret lodged deep in my tissues that I'm unaware of? I unearth nothing new. Nothing new about myself with these questions. After all, I've spent most of my life inquiring within. I change tactics and begin eating only fruit, vegetables, coffee, and tea, alongside heaping scoops of psyllium husk. And finally, it happens, the release. One morning, my bowels let loose, and as I sit there on the toilet, I can barely contain my joy. As I hold down the button to flush the toilet to make sure everything swooshes down, I look in the bowl and to my horror, the floating turds begin to dance. They actually jump. Am I seeing things right? Did someone slip me a psychedelic? Is my shit really animated and moving? I, I what just came out of me? Because it isn't going down the pipes. It wants to be a float. My mind races. What is this? A rat? A frog? Hang on. I let go of the button and stare at the white porcelain bowl and there looking up at me, legs spread as wide as he can muster, is a lizard holding on for dear life. Oh my God. I blurt out to no one. Oh my God, poor thing. How did he get there? Oh, and through that onslaught. I leave him there, run out the door and down the stone walkway to reception. I need help, please, please, I need help. There's a lizard in my toilet. The woman at the reception in a red sari picks up the phone. I will call housekeeping. Okay, I think, help is on the way. I feel relieved. I turn back to run to my room. There he is, still spread eagle, trying his mightiest to not get sucked down the pipes. Please come housekeeping, please come, please come. I mutter, looking at this little being trying to save himself. No one is coming. The bowl is too slippery for him to walk his way up and out. Housekeeping seems especially slow. 
I just can't bear it anymore. I want to save this little creature. So I grab a hand towel and dip it into the toilet bowl. As if he knows exactly what I'm doing, the lizard immediately steps onto his bridge to freedom. A shiver of fear washes through me as he crawls onto the white cloth, afraid he might crawl up my arm, but he doesn't. He's breathing hard. My own heart is beating loudly. He stays steady on his chariot while I open the door of the room and together we walk outside. I lower the towel to the ground for him to dismount. He climbs off and walks straight up the stone wall and stops. I stand up and we both stand there and look at one another. His chest heaves in and out. He tilts his head to look at me. I tell him, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to drown you in my shit. We stay like that for a while, breathing and watching both of us free again. Yeah, that was, that was a tricky trip, trying to lead that retreat for the first few days. And then just being like, okay, I'm completely, um, I'm completely distracted here. Yeah. Let's see. I'm curious. I'm going to go into our gallery view for a minute. Are there any stories? Like, I know some of you have the book. I'm curious if there's any stories that you want me to read. I'm just going to ask you that. Anybody? Mm -hmm. Oh, Darlene, that's great. Yeah. Now, should I just keep picking? Okay. All right. Oh, here's Jeannie. All right, I'm gonna go back. I'll pick pick another one. Oh, what are some of my favorites? You know, they all hold kind of a special spot for me. It's, you know, I think it depends on my mood, but I'll read this one. This one's definitely a favorite because um, I feel like it speaks to our bias, you know? Mm. Like we all have biases. So this is called A Bridge Across Worlds. <clears throat> I spot her as I stand in line with my red bag at the Egypt air counter on my way from Istanbul to Cairo. She dons the black Muslim veils, black gloves, and her eyes peer out of a tiny slit of fabric. My thoughts turn to oppressed Saudi women who aren't allowed to drive and whose heavy-handed husbands keep them in line. I wonder who this woman is, what she's doing traveling and where she's going. Her robes touch the floor. I can't even see her feet. A flurry of feelings passes through me. In a nanosecond, my mind launches into a litany of thoughts, imagining what she'd think of me sinner, disbeliever, loose American woman with her short sleeves and short skirts, temptress. She moves on and disappears into the airport by the time I check my bags. I don't give it a second thought until I'm sitting on the plane in seat 22H, heading to Cairo. The plane is nearly full. But the two seats next to me are empty, and here she comes, walking down the aisle. When I see her, I have the flickering thought, oh, please don't sit here. At which point she gestures that these are her seats, one for her and the young man behind her. He hoists a huge bag, a huge blue bag into the bin over my head and then glides past me to the window seat. Sorry she says as she brushes past my knees while hugging her purse close to her body. No problem, I say. The woman behind me raises her eyebrows in my direction as if to say, crazy. What are the odds, I ponder. I gaze down. I'm full of that feeling of not quite sure how to behave. The cultural gap feels wide. I don't understand that 
don't understand the hijab, the need to cover oneself so fully. It feels repressive. It reminds me of the nuns in grade school and how we couldn't see any bit of flesh or hair underneath the long robes. I always wondered what Sister Teresa looked like out from underneath the wimple. I assume this woman won't want to talk to me, the American sinner. I'll focus on my book. Not that I was looking for conversation anyway. But then something ignites the volley of questions. Simple ones at first. Where are you going? What's your name? Where are you from? And we're in. We're chatting. My two lost friends. Her name is Mona. She was born in Egypt, now lives in Qatar and has eight children. She met her husband when she, sorry, <laughs> when she was living in London. It was a love marriage, not an arranged marriage. They're separated now after 17 years. I think arranged marriages are better, she tells me. A mom knows her children, knows the values they need in a partner. Emotions fade, love fades. There's so much more than the whimsy of emotion. We dive into religion, talking about God, Buddhism, and yoga. Oh, I know God exists, she says. He wants the very best for us. She's so open. Not what I was expecting. Okay, tell me about the hijab. What's it like to wear all black and not reveal a bit of skin, I ask. It's so hard for me. It's so hard for me to imagine wearing those heavy clothes, especially in hot weather. I love it, she says. I feel safe and contained. There's something completely freeing about it. No one can see you, but you can see out into the world. She tells me she's been to been to Cairo. She tells me she's been in Cairo on a business trip. What's your business? Lingerie. I burst out laughing. Seriously? Lingerie. Seriously, she giggles. We're about to land. The time has flown by. We've talked the entire way. So would you ever think of visiting the U.S., I ask? No, that's a place I won't go. I don't think the people would know how to deal with my attire. I'm too much of a symbol of what is not right in the Muslim world for the Americans. I take in her words. She's right. Look at me. Open-minded liberal with a whole host of judgments about this person. I didn't know just because she's wearing the hijab. You're right. It's sad but true, I say. As the plane descends, we exchange business cards. It was so great to meet you, I say. Yes. Yes, it was. Many blessings to you, she offers. As I get off the plane, my heart feels full and grateful, grateful for her openness, grateful for my openness, grateful to have built a tiny bridge across worlds. <laughs> Thank you. PJ, I see you. Yes. Yes, I, I would love to hear... Um where I came from, which is near the end, uh, page 238. Oh, I was very with that, and I would like to hear it in your own voice. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, I have to do one thing. I have to step away and get a tissue because that, I, you know, <laughs> you know me, I'm a crier. I'll be right back. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Oh, yes. Where I came from. So I do want to tell you all, I'm, I'm talking to someone on Thursday this week about the audio book, because people have been like, are you going to do an audio book? So I am going to do an audio book. Yeah. All right. Hang on. Let's go here. All right. Where I, where I come from. Yes. I come from the Olivetti, the Smith Corona, the Underwood, 
from old pay phones, dispatched stories, some misunderstood. I come from the cock and bull, martini lunches and sunset boulevard, the Hamburg hat, the Morse code, rat tat tat. I come from Okinawa mud, dug in and dirty from wartime words, the spit of rockets, ping of snipers, charred flesh and gurneys. I am from the front lines, the front pages, the pen and ink at press that keeps the nation abreast. Bay of Pigs, Chiang Kai-shek, Selma to Montgomery, drug cartels and other scandalous clientele. I am from the ruins, remnants left behind. He didn't know he had been so blind. The carcass in my closet now is gone. I forgive you, Father. There is nothing to be done. Yeah. Thanks. That one. I um, thought that was a beautiful summary of some of the other mentions that you had of your father, and it kind of all brought it together. And mm. as a person who had a difficult relationship with her own father, um, mm. I, I thought it was just beautiful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, and you, I think it's a nice place to pause there and kind of stop. I'm going to share a little more of the slides uh, at the end, but, you know, I think this book, you really, you really nailed it, that it touches on how do we, all of us integrate, right? How do we integrate all the bits of, of ourselves that actually are lost, you know, the lost pieces that I think we spend our lives trying to bring back together. And for me, um, I really feel like while this is a very personal journey story, like my friend asked me the other night, like, how can you share these stories? And I'm like, well, there really are, I'm the micro of the macro, right? Like you just said it, a difficult relationship with your own father. And I think that whatever our journey is to become whole, my hope is that, you know, some of these stories remind you of your own um, your own life and your own journey. Yeah. So yeah, I'd love to open up for any thoughts or questions or, you know, anything you want to throw out there. And then I do have, you know, I do have a vision for the book that I want to invite you into. So, you know, don't, don't leave yet. And cause I'm going to ask you at the end there. Right. But if you have a question, just like you did uh, PJ, if you go to reactions, there's a hand where you can say raise hand, and that's the easiest for me to see, you know? So I would love to hear any thoughts or questions that you guys have, if you have any. <laughs> no, nothing? Stella. And you have to unmute yourself, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, we just met last week. And uh, interestingly enough, it feels like I've known you all my life. Aww. And then by this book, and also <laughs> a Catholic, I have not stopped laughing. Uh, there's just, I, your, go, your Go Van is like my dream. Oh, Van um, Gogh. <laughs> anyway, it's just been a real pleasure. I, yeah, go, oh, Van, yeah, Van Gogh, yeah, but um, I care for a 92-year-old mom, so it's been, you know, a few hard years, just sort of a little bit isolated, but we just moved, and this has just been a real welcome treat, unexpected treat in my life, so thank you. Thank you, thank you, it's so lovely to meet you, and yeah, and you know, we're all in these periods, right, and then it will change, yeah. Yeah. So, so Stella, I just want to say, and this is to all of us, whatever it is we're living, right? I also have an elder mom and two elder dogs. It's like, that's the, that's the juice, right? There's the juice, that. Well, and, you know, I kind of live by the, the line, we live the life we are given. So it's kind of like, how are we going to approach that? And um, I'm very happy and I've got a wonderful husband, very supportive with my mom and daughter. So, you know, you got to just, I think, make the best of it. We just can't control anything but our attitude. So 
but we sure can control what we read. And thank you. This is fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thanks for coming. Yeah. All right. We'll go Susan and then Goldie. I can't hear you, dear. That's so weird. Okay, Susan, I can't hear you, but you're not muted. That's very strange. Okay, you might have to write your question in the chat. So I'm going to go to Goldie, okay? Hi, Gold. <laughs> Hi, Goldie. Hi, Diane. This is Barbara. I'm with Goldie. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. I'm like, where are you? Oh, yes. Now, hello. There you are. Hi. Well, I just noticed that you responded to my comment to you, and I thought I would like to read it to the group. Oh, you know, I would love that. Listen to what uh, Barbara wrote. It's just stunning. Yes, please do. It's gorgeous. I have read your stories and love that they are short and easy to read, yet carry quite a wallet. Musings, affirmations for living life in the moment, personal stories of struggle, joy, grief, trial, and tribulations, a kind of coming of age, for the ages we move through, daring readers to delve into their own life stories, the dance of receive and let go, balance off center, basically attuning to the yin and yang of it all. Mm. The, reading gets, the reader gets to fall into Diane's pell-mell of her life, okay. her daring do, daring the reader in a lighthearted way to at least take a peek behind their own curtains. As Julia Cameron, an artist's way might say, Diane often supports her life, her being, heart and soul, I fell in love with you comes to mind. Hmm. Healthy extravagance. Hmm. She dares to dare and would probably love to play that game with you. Hmm. Truth or dare. Hmm. Bravo and thank you, Diane. Aww. Thank you so much. What a beautiful, I feel like you, you reviewed the book. Uh, it's so beautiful. Like, thank you. It was a delight. I will give it to my daughter. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and you know, I hope part of it too, I want to say it's like, I, I also wrote this like to inspire us all to take the risks, right? To take the risks to step into the fear. You know, what's, what's the worst that's going to happen? Yeah, so um, let's, try, let's try Susan again and then we're going to go to Beth. Susan, let's see if it works. Oh, shoot, it's not working. It's such a bummer. All right, I'm going to see. All right. All right, well, we're going to go to Beth. <laughs> Susan, you write me that. Okay. So, Susan, I had the same issue the other day, and I just left the meeting and came back in, and it fixed itself. I don't know what's going on. Um, my comment is very short and sweet, but I feel like I'm sitting around the fire of oral storytelling and how powerful it is. And Diane, your stories are speaking to me and a very deep level of my heart, but it's almost this primal thing of we're sitting together, listening to oral history. And it's so powerful for me. And I just want to thank you for um, hosting this meeting and giving us this opportunity. And I'm thinking someone needs to start Sunday story time because I've like snuggled in my little spot and it's like okay. bedtime stories okay. all over. Again. Oh my I'm God. So, so comforted by this. Listen, thank you. And I, okay, I have to go back to sharing the screen for a minute because this vision has come from not just me, but like all of you, and uh, particularly my friend Lorette too, who's thought about this. So, so check this out. And Susan, I see your question. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. But I wanted to share the vision of the book. So first of all, I really want to get it into the hands of as many people as possible because of this that I think that it helps us all remember the stories. There's something really visceral about it, right? And so my bigger vision is to get it to Oprah. So, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I got to tell people, right? Like, ooh, let's try to get it to Oprah. I have no idea how to do that, but, you know, we can try. <laughs> I thought it'd be a fun thing, like, ooh, how do we do that? Um, but really, 
it's for me about helping us all just what like you said Beth remember our own stories and and to share story time and so the next piece of this is um sharing it right I'd love it like if you have a book great if you haven't gotten the book you know get a book if you would if you want to then if you like the book tell people about it and oh and if you have read the book and you like it one of the big things is to write a review which I'm you know I'm practicing now and this this is my next edge of my comfort zone is asking for this right is to ask and I just want to tell you like it's definitely like the edge of my comfort zone um because I think that's what how we all grow what's the edge of our comfort zone so to ask for you to write your review whatever on amazon or barnes and noble or balboa but beth here's the here's the thing story time with diane i was thinking i could zoom in to your parties or your birthday gathering or your book club and that the idea would be i'd share some stories and it could be you know, and we, we could talk as the people who wanted to be the host or hostess and people would buy the book. Like that would be, there would be no payment for me except people would buy the book who came and that it could be that sort of conversation starter and, and the storytelling. So I just wanted to share that piece with you. And then there's one last little piece and then we're going to go back. I'm going to go back to questions, but one of the things that I've also done this year, which has been a phenomenal experience, is I've been working with a group of people in this creative process immersion that I've developed and then have taught over 10 months. And I just want to tell you that like this is next year's creative process immersion is open and it's um, it's really about checking in with your soul's purpose using the, the expressive arts and it's deep and it's fun, it's transformative, it's really empowering, and it moves us towards part of why we're here. You know, I, I think that's really part of what the, the creative process immersion is about. It's like having a deep connection with yourself. So I'll, you know, I'll be emailing about that to everybody, but I just wanted to tell all of you since you're here. And then this is just a little, um, I drew this probably 22 years ago, but it's one of my favorite little personal drawings from a journal, actually. And just to say thank you, you know, for being here. So I'm going to stop that share. Yeah, like a deep, deep thank you. And and I also see that Susan um, Susan wrote the question. Let's look at Susan's question. I just wanted you to know that I've read half your book and I'm learning so much about you. Yes. I know, right? I have to tell you, just to, I just want to respond to that, Susan. It was terrifying, the idea of people reading all of these stories. I'm like, oh my God, they're all going to know I've had sex. It's like, duh. <laughs> like, yeah, but that was how bad it was for the Catholic thing. Anyway, I feel bad that you weren't accepted by some of your, oh yes. Yeah, well, that's a cross-cultural thing, right? There's some pieces about um, being married to heiress and 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 his his sister specifically there's the story of his sister who you know he never spoke to me and and really shunned him for the time we were married and painful but these are real things for people and and it's like that's the indoctrination of religion and it's and I, i'm okay with it it was very difficult at the time but it's like oh yeah it's not personal so um yes oh ruth i love that you talk about poop yes <laughs> oh my gosh so thank you susan yeah thank you for that and i just i just want to open it up for you know anybody else who may want to say anything or have a question and stephanie thank you for staying this whole time you don't we haven't even met and it's like oh you're still here so nice thank you yeah Anybody else? I want to say on, on this call specifically, I want to say thank you to my friend Lorette, who has been seriously has been one of the biggest cheerleaders every day this year. 
like, thank you. She is like, we're in touch every day. It's crazy. <laughs> and it's been amazing. So thank you for your support and love. And just, I'm so grateful to be in community with all of you, really. You know, it's a beautiful thing. And Beth, oh, there's Jeannie Heilman. Oh, that's so nice. Um, Beth McKibben, she is another little whisperer in my ear of ideas, just sort of feeding me these ideas. It's like, oh, go there or talk to so-and-so. Yeah. Anybody else want to, you guys are all shy. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to do this. It's 613. Oh, yes. Stella, do you have another thought? I'm going to end with one poem. Well, the, the end of Susan's comment is fa fascinating to me. Did you see that? That, hold on. <laughs> I'm trying. She talks about your husband, but she said, I don't know if you did this inadvertently, but your 108 is actually a Jewish number. It is divisible oh. by 18. Oh, Chai, which means life in Hebrew. I thought that was fascinating. Thank you. Actually, I did not catch that. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, it takes a village. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to close us with a short poem, and I think it's really fitting. It's called What Are Prayers? Yeah. So here we go. Sit still. Send prayers. What are prayers? Little wishes of wellness, little moments of gratitude, little cracks in the heart for the ocean of life to burst through in a tidal wave, delivering joy, delivering love, delivering whatever you need to open, to crack, to stop resisting. Why not live wide open, own it all, the shame, the pain, the anger, the jealousy, the righteousness, all the places that need buffing for you to shine your diamond heart. Own it all. The bliss beyond imagination, the ecstasy of love for this life, this moment, this breath that keeps you alive. Welcome the cracking open of your heart to feel the pain that grows compassion, the despair of grief that makes it hard to breathe, hard to get up out of bed, hard to tend the children, the fire of rage that spurs you to action, the rigidity of righteousness that closes your heart to the other. Welcome the cracking open of your heart to feel joy that is always within reach in the stillness of winter snow in the satin skin of your newborn, in the eyes of your devoted dog. Let yourself churn in the tumbler of life. Let yourself crack beyond repair so you can be delivered up on the beach, polished and smooth. It is all here in this moment, not out there in the future. So sit still, send prayers. Welcome it all. Yeah, thanks you guys. So I do wanna say, thank you. I'm gonna do a live launch in the Bay Area and in Spokane. So those of you who live in those spots, would love to see you December 4th in the Bay Area. That'll be a live party we can actually touch. <laughs> and December 18th in Spokane. So I'll send you guys that stuff. But oh my God, it's so good to see you all. Deborah Dunning, we work Hi. together in our 20s. It's like, what? I know. I'm so excited for you. I can't wait to buy the book. It's definitely going to be a, a Christmas gift for some friends and my sister. Um, oh, yay. Yeah. And I'm so, I'm, Diane is so good at making things happen. I'm so proud of you, Diane. <laughs> I'm so impressed. Congratulations. Thank you. 
thank yeah. you. It's just, I, I will see you when you come out. Yes, yes. I know. And then like New York and Texas and Georgia and all the people who are in other places, like I wish I could meet up with you. So wish I could meet up with you. Oh, look, Shauncee's here. I didn't see that. Stephanie. Yay. Yes. Talk to me. Talk to us. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I really, really enjoyed um, all of this, seeing so many new faces and some beautiful faces I already know. Mm. Um, what, what I really responded to was just the authenticity of your sharing. And I think that that is what is um, so powerful about not just the stories themselves, but hearing the stories be read by you. And you became so moved when you were telling the story about meeting the woman on the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, it really creates an access, you know, for us to be like, you know, gosh, you know, remember those times throughout all of our lives, you know, where yeah. we've had those moments and um, what beautiful opportunities for, for growth and development it is when we catch ourselves in those times of, gosh, you know, I thought I knew what was going on and I just did not know what was going on. So right? thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. And I just wanted to tell you that I'm actually in Santa Fe right now oh. and it just started raining when you oh. were telling your story about wishing it would rain. Oh my God. <laughs> And it wow. hasn't rained. We've been like, where's the snow? Where's the rain? So I just wanted to make sure you knew that, you know, maybe it's a little late, but your wish for rain just came true. So Thank you. congratulations on what, the rain and your book. What a delight to meet you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Oh, so you're welcome. And thank you to Lorette, my, my dear friend Lorette for inviting me. I mean, what a wonderful opening to a whole new, a whole new world. Yeah, isn't it fun? And this is the other thing, coming together through friends, right? That we come, oh, yeah. through, you know, it's like, oh, other, I always feel like great people should know great people. And, you know, we, we are those people to connect each other. So, well, I thought I had met you before um, when you were talking about raves in Oakland. I was like, I wonder if she knows my friend, Andy Pearson. Andy Pearson. No, don't know Andy Pearson, but it was back in the day. <laughs> I, I she probably doesn't remember a lot from back then anyway anyway congratulations thank you and you know nice I've been you. For a while yeah um lee oh my gosh thanks stephanie hi hi i'm so excited to uh be here at this book launch and it was so beautiful hearing you read your stories and be here with your community hi. um and I, uh, I'm really, I have a, I'm curious about the creative process immersion. And yeah. I know that there's a huge visual component to that, oh, but yeah. is, is writing um, stories part of it? Is it, is it, is that incorporated with it? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Lee. And I have to say, you know, I've been thinking about that this year, it was heavily focused on visual, but Mm -hmm. I feel like it, it almost depends on who shows up, you mm. know, because um, if there's more, I mean, this is just recently going through my mind because it's very, it's only 20 people. And mm. I do feel like the writing portion, um, you know, like Barb and Bonnie were here uh, in, in that. I mean, it was definitely, wouldn't you say it's more visually oriented, but we do write, we definitely write, but the focus has- I know you're leading a, a writing workshop now too. Yeah. And if yes. there's some writing component to the journal um, journal practice that you do. So I was yep. just wondering how, how anyways, how just sort of curious. Well, just to say, and I'll just say this as, you know, sort of bringing it together, the, the creative process immersion really brings together the three modalities of writing, visual, and movement to integrate body, heart, mind. So the movement is body, right? We hold so much in our bodies. Oh, and Beth is in there too. Um, and then the mental is more the, the written plane. And then the visual is the heart. But I, I can tell... Um, you know, I, I, it's like, there is a piece that feels like 
it can be individualized to the group, which it's really, yeah. So I it's in a there. tongue tied at the moment about it. Yeah, no, no, I'm just, I'm just curious because, uh, I mean, I didn't even know that you were a writer, you know. Oh. <laughs> I've known like like I, I, years. <laughs> no, no, no. But I in like I I know you more through yoga and then as a visual artist. And then uh -huh. when you were like, and I'm writing this book, and I'm like, you're writing a book? What? Yeah, you know, yeah. and then to like hear the stories. My book is coming next week. I ordered it, but um I just I I love I love the mixture of it all and I love the the the, the you know the stories and people sharing everything. So I'm wondering, and I know that in that immersion there's there's a huge sharing process so i was just curious yes, about and, you know and the... i just saw what beth wrote she said you know it's really it is it's a transformative process i think that's the thing it depends on um hey Jeannie heilman i just have to say hello hi another yoga teacher person lee um that yeah it's 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 basically it's really transformative and the the thing that happens is it leads towards final projects towards the second half of the year and then that's where it becomes more individualized on what kind of project we're working on but we're mm -hmm. actually looking at seven pillars of the creative process which are and that's really the fundamental piece of it play curiosity experimentation risk taking um discovery surrender which leads to personal empowerment and so then we use the three expressive arts forms but that's really the fundamental piece that we're looking at those and how that happens in our lives and i've noticed across all the modalities that um that these pillars hold up you know like if we're a mover like if you start to play, it's like, oh, well, let me just play with my wrist. Let me play with the fingers. Let me play with the elbow. And then that leads to choreographing a new piece, right? But it starts with these small things. Oh, it starts with playing with the words on the page. And how do we, we just play with silliness? And then we get curious and it leads to a poem. And same with the visual, like, oh, I'm just gonna play with the colors and the marks. And then how does that lead to the painting or the card making? And I just, I'm gonna show this because like right now, like the, you know, and a lot of you have gotten cards from me. Like this is the, these are the base layers of my, bye Wendy, good to see you, bye. Like this is the base of a bunch of my cards that I make. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's the play and then curiosity and then going into these experimenting and risk taking and then that's how it works with our lives like where do we not take risks we start to see like oh wow i'm really a perfectionist like i don't allow myself to play or i don't allow myself to take the risk and 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 that to me is really the deep interest of this creative process immersion that it starts to pull pull on the threads of who we are and how we live mm -hmm. and recently so tom Askman is here my friend who has been teaching art for 30 40 years something like that he's an amazing amazing inspiring art teacher and recently i was with him and i rem I, I asked the question I'm like i think i'm at the point where you know like we say oh i'm out of the box and i think at this point in my life i'm like what is the box? Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, and that's scary because you can't put yourself back in the box. So it's a, actually a really scary thing, right? To pull ourselves out of the box and live our very unique lives. And each one of us has that capacity. And I like, and this is why I put a flower coming out of the shoe on the front cover, blooming into ourselves. Like we are here to be ourselves. We are not here to be, you know, the version that our parents wanted or the version that our school wanted or the version that anybody in our family wanted. No, you know, and I know I'm getting a little like <laughs> militant in my tone, but 
but that's and and even like this book form for me I realized wow I just I couldn't like the publisher gave me a totally different version. I sent this image and they put it together and it had Diane Sherman big and Ian Borrowed Shoes big. And I'm like, no, no, I know you can't really see my name. You have to look for the name. I don't care. I want the image. I want, I want people to feel like they have a piece of art on the table, not like my name as the big highlight. You know, I don't care about the name. So anyway, that's what I feel like for me. That's my passion about teaching this creative process immersion. It's like, yes, let's just become more of yourself. Like, I don't want you to do my art. I'm interested in you trying to help facilitate you to do you in the biggest way possible. So, yeah. <laughs> Is that clearer? Like, Lorette. Is that clearer what I do? Yes? Okay, good. She's like my, you know, we talk a lot. And sometimes Lorette's like, I'm not totally clear on that creative process immersion. And I've been trying to like hone in on, you know, what is it that I teach? Because it's even hard for me to articulate. Like, I'm trying to help you become you, not become me. Yeah. I love you people. Thank you. Seriously, I do. I'm so grateful for each one of you. Yeah, like truly. I know. I wish I were with you. I know. Anne Hanneberg. Anne was an amazing, she was one of my reader friends who just was like, yes. Thank you for all your enthusiasm, Anne, in the beginning. It was an absolute honor. It really was. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I wish you were here. I'd, I'd give you some food. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's hard to go. And Glow, Glow and I went to graduate school together. We were in art school together. It was just so fun. It's like, and Joe, I just met last week. So Stephanie, you take, you take it for the newest person. Is she still here? Oh, there you are. Yes, you're like the newest person, someone I haven't met who's here. I love that. Thank you for holding that spot, you know. And Steve, Steve married Eris and me. That was amazing. Yeah. Wow, you, you, yeah. So good to see you. Hmm. <sighs> All right, lovelies. It must be time lots of love thank you for thank you for launching this i feel like you've helped me launch the baby and i'll see some of you in december either in spokane or the bay area and um yeah and please do like let's get it to oprah <laughs> let's play that game why not right why not who knows who knows who we don't know who knows who knows who who knows oprah this for fun all right Mwah. and can i just say if you're needing a retreat a yoga retreat i know a lot of you started with me with yoga lee evans and Jeannie heilman are two phenomenal seriously phenomenal yoga teachers phenomenal and mindy hi mindy <gasps> look at that so sorry we're late what's that Sorry, we're so late. Oh, yes. Well, unfortunately, we're ending. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Life is crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's okay, but you know what? You're going to catch the recording. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> look at you, cutie pies. Oh, bye, Beth. Amy, thank you for being here. Stephanie, Lorette, Lee. Oh, my gosh. Ruth and Glenn. Oh, Tom. Mindy, thanks for coming in at the end. I love that. Oh, I'm sorry. Right there. We tried. <laughs> oh, no, listen, it's all good. 